In this lesson, we're going to look at an overview of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to describe the seven types of electromagnetic radiation, or EM for short, then explain examples of ionizing radiation, and then explain how infrared and ultraviolet radiation were discovered. Now, it's pretty common for students to ask me pretty much every year whether I believe in ghosts or not, and every time I have to tell them, no, I don't. Now, I sort of get this look as if I've just ruined Christmas or I've got no sense of fun or imagination. Which isn't true, really. I, I believe in plenty of things we can't see. But when you think that maybe roughly over 100 billion people have died on this planet, you would assume that this planet would be pretty much infested with ghosts. And in my 30 plus years of existence, I'm pretty sure I'd have encountered one by now. But you don't have to believe in ghosts for the world to be a fascinating and mesmerising place. As I said, I believe in things we can't see. Check out this video. So here I've got a remote control, I'm pressing the button down, you're seeing nothing. But then when I hold it to camera and press the button, you can see a light flashing. This just shows us one of the limitations of our own eyes. Our eyes alone cannot detect the light which is emitted from that remote control. But if you look at it through a digital camera, digital cameras can detect that light. Right now, I could probably be safe in assuming you are bathing in all sorts of things you can't see such as microwave radiation, which you use for your phones and Wi-Fi in the house. The truth is the universe communicates with us using light. If you assume this line here represents all the different types of light that the universe uses and sends out to us, it may make you feel a little bit sad to realise that we only detect that much of it. The part of light that we can actually detect is called visible light, simply because we can see it. We can actually detect three types of light, red, blue and green. These are the same types of light that you'll see coming off your TV. In fact, if you go very, very close to your TV and look at every individual pixel, you'll see they're all made from red, blue and green. By mixing these colours, we can make all the range of colours we perceive. But let's get out of our own head for a second and let's imagine the world through dog's eyes. It was long thought that dogs actually see in black and white, but recently they've discovered dogs see in blue and yellow. They can distinguish between blue and yellow hues, but they cannot perceive red. So if you can try and imagine your world without red in it, you'll be perceiving the world like a dog does. But far more impressive is the mantis shrimp. Now I said we can only detect three types of light. We have three receptors, three photoreceptors in our eye to detect blue, red, and green. Mantis shrimp have 16. What this means, if you can even get your head around it, is they can see colors we can't even imagine. I mean, what I'd give just to be able to view the world as a mantis shrimp just for one second, I mean, it'd just be astonishing. But if we go just beyond the visible part of the spectrum, this is a region called infrared. We can no longer detect this light, but other animals can. For example, rattlesnakes detect infrared. So if you were to look at a human through rattlesnake eyes, they would look like this. The hotter an object is, the whiter it appears, and the colder an object is, the more purple and blue it appears. So you can see the hair is cooler here, but around the face it's hotter. If we go to the other side of the spectrum, just beyond the violet part of the rainbow or the visible spectrum, we go into ultraviolet. We can't see ultraviolet, but there are organisms that can. For example, rats and bees. But the world looks truly amazing through ultraviolet vision especially plants, and that would explain why my rats, when I had them, when they were alive, were obsessed with plants. Every time I let them out of the cage, they would run towards plants. So what is the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, the sun emits energy, which I'm sure you're aware of. You can feel it down here on your skin, the warmth of the sun. You can also see it with your eyes, this energy. And it spreads out from the sun, from its source. Any energy that spreads out from its source is known as radiation. This energy radiates out from a central point. There are seven different frequencies of radiation. We call this range of different frequencies the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see them here. So here's the sun, and it's emitting different types of light. We can only see this small band here, known as visible light. That's why I've written a V here. But some wavelengths of light are incredibly long. This is the radio wave part of the spectrum. Then we have microwaves, which aren't quite as long, but they're still long wavelengths, and then infrared, and then visible. Then beyond visible, we have ultraviolet, x-rays, and then gamma rays. You can see at this part of the spectrum, the wavelength is longest, whereas this part, it's shortest. 
All electromagnetic waves are transverse. That means as they travel forward, they disturb particles by moving them up and down at 90 degrees to the direction of the wave. And all of these waves, every single one of them, travel at exactly the same speed in a vacuum. A vacuum you can think of as space, where there are no particles. So in other words, they all travel at the speed of light, 300 million meters per second. Now because they all have different wavelengths, and because they all travel at the same speed, we can assume that they have different frequencies. So in other words, this part of the spectrum, you expect the waves to arrive more frequently every second, because they're traveling at the same speed, but they're shorter wavelengths, and more waves are crammed together, so you expect more waves to pass a point every second, higher frequency. Whereas this part of the spectrum, they're spread out, but they're traveling at the same speed, but you'd expect less waves to pass this point every second as they move past. These are important facts you'll need to know for an exam. They usually come up as multiple choice uh, questions which you tick. You also need to remember the different types of radiation. And here's a little word rhyme to help you remember it. Radioactive mice invade Venus using X-ray guns. So radioactive, R for radio, mice, M for microwave, invade, I for infrared, Venus, V for visible, using, U for UV, X for X-ray, and G, guns for gamma. So radioactive mice invade Venus using X-ray guns. And that's how you describe the seven types of EM radiation. So here's one of the most important points of the lesson. The frequency of each wave determines how the wave interacts with matter. In other words, the frequency of a wave affects the properties of the wave, the way it behaves, and the way it causes matter to behave. So depending on its frequency, some waves are absorbed by objects. For example, visible light is absorbed by our eye, more specifically, our retina at the back of our eye. Infrared and UV radiation have an interesting relationship with our Earth. UV, because it has a very high frequency relative to the rest of the spectrum, it can penetrate through our atmosphere due to its short wavelength. So due to the amount of energy it delivers per second, it's very penetrating and it can get through our atmosphere. When it's absorbed by our Earth, our Earth re-emits this energy because it's become warmer as infrared radiation. Now infrared has a longer wavelength, it has a lower frequency, and as such it cannot penetrate our atmosphere as effectively, so it gets reflected back to Earth. This is the cause of global warming. This atmosphere contains greenhouse gases, and the more greenhouse gases there are, the more this happens. So these are just some real world examples of how frequency affects how the wave interacts with matter. All radiation, as it gets absorbed by objects, has a warming effect. Um, for example, two specifics you need to know is microwaves heat body cells. Specifically, microwaves heat up fats and carbohydrates and water. This is why when a microwave is on, it's best not to stand near it. Infrared radiation has a higher frequency and it can cause skin burn. So the more infrared you absorb, it can cause your skin to burn. But these are just two examples all radiation will have a warming effect on the object that absorbs that type of radiation. Next, and this is a really important word, some radiation is ionizing, more specifically beyond visible light. So to the right of visible light, you have UV, X-rays and gamma rays. These are very high frequency radiations and they are very damaging to us. They are ionizing. What ionizing literally means is they knock electrons off atoms. They have so much energy that when they strike the outer shell of an atom and basically affect an electron or an electron absorbs that energy, that electron will be knocked off the atom and that creates an ion, a charged atom. Now you'll learn plenty more about that in chemistry, but for now, what that really means is ionizing radiations can cause cancer, and they do this by damaging DNA, which causes mutations that can lead to cancer. So UV, for example, we all know there's links to skin cancer. X-rays are more penetrating, can also lead to cancer by damaging DNA, as can gamma rays. UV can also cause eye damage, and uh, it's responsible for an eye condition known as cataracts. In fact, many mountain communities, many people who live high up on mountains, often suffer from this as UV radiation enters their eye and affects their lens over time. You see, they're more exposed to it higher up. And over time, their 
lens cooks much like the white of an egg in a frying pan, causing a cloudy lens which needs to be removed before you can see again. Cataracts are also very common in dogs. So UV, X-rays and gamma rays are three examples of ionising electromagnetic radiation. But you also need to know that certain matter can also be ionising, certain particles, not just waves. For example, some rocks and also some metals like uranium here can emit particles called alpha or beta particles. And just like the ionising EM radiations we talked about above, they can also knock electrons off atoms and cause exactly the same problems. You'll learn a lot more about this in Physics Module 2. So that's how we explain examples of ionising radiation. So now let's look at the two scientists who discovered infrared and UV radiation. They did this separately, not together. So Herschel is responsible for discovering infrared and Ritter for UV. So in 1800, the scientist Herschel decided to shine visible light through a prism which splits up visible light into its seven different colours. Basically, visible light is a mix of different wavelengths and by shining it through a prism, every wavelength separates out. What he then decided to do was take a thermometer and measure the temperature for every different wavelength of light. What he discovered was that the temperature increased from blue and violet all the way up to red. So here was the lowest temperature and here was the highest. Perhaps out of curiosity or perhaps just out of instinct, he decided to measure the temperature just beyond the red part of the spectrum. And what he noticed was it was hottest here. This led to the discovery of infrared radiation. So it was hottest beyond the red part of this visible spectrum, which led to the discovery of another type of radiation we couldn't see called infrared. So remember, used a prism to split up visible light, took the temperature of every different colour, realised it was getting hotter towards the red, and just beyond the red, it was hottest. This led to the discovery of infrared. Next up, the scientist Ritter discovered UV radiation after using a very similar experiment. This was just after 1801. Just like before, just like Herschel, he shone visible light through a prism and once again it split up into its seven colours. He noticed that if you expose silver chloride paper, that's just a chemical, to each wavelength of light, it would darken. So given enough time, it would turn from a silvery white to black. He timed how long it took for silver chloride paper to darken for every colour, and he realised it got faster the closer it got to violet. So Ritter, in a similar way to Herschel, decided to test this just beyond the violet part of the spectrum. In other words, the part we can't see, and he realised that it darkened the fastest at this point. This led to the discovery of ultraviolet radiation. So to recap, Ritter shone visible light through a prism, split up into its seven colours. He then exposed each colour to silver chloride paper and timed how long it took for silver chloride paper to darken. He noticed that just beyond violet light, it darkened fastest. This led to the discovery of ultraviolet radiation. That is how you explain how infrared and ultraviolet radiation were discovered.